This is the Black Power Chronicles, and I'm Karen Spellman here today at the University of the District of Columbia, and we're welcoming as our special interviewees or narrators on our oral history project, the Williams family, Dr. and Mrs. Elvira Williams, who have for the past 40 years dedicated their lives to improving the quality of life of those uh, our brothers and sisters on the continent of Africa. They have um, concentrated their work uh, in the country of Tanzania, but being the people that they are, they have also offered their services in the Gambia. And I'm just very pleased and honored to have them join us this afternoon. And I'd like to say welcome, uh, Elvira, and welcome Irving to Thank the you. Black Power Chronicles Oral History Series. Thank you so much. Thank you, we're so happy to have you. So let's go to the beginning. Um, we always want to know who we're talking to, and the way we learn that is to ask you about your family, your very your early childhood, your your upraising, as we say, uh, in the community, and what inspired you to in your from your your childhood and your family to uh, start doing the work that you do. Uh, we'll start with Elvira, ladies first, and then we'll get Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I have been very interested in working with diversity and really knowing a little about uh, the legacy of African American people, which takes us back to Africa. Uh, I was born in Washington, D.C., and went to the local schools here through high school and undergraduate uh, at Howard University, and I did my graduate work at Wisconsin University. But I guess uh, early on, well, when we came through school, it was uh, during a segregated period. Not that we're far from there now. And I always had lots of concerns with the fact that we were treated inferior and I felt that um, we should be treated equally. I thought equity should be for all people. In fact, it was during the early times. My father was from North Carolina. My mother was from Virginia. Uh, outside of Richmond. And I never went to my father's home in North Carolina uh, until I was adult and had children because he said I was too outspoken about my views and he did not want me to get their family in trouble. Uh, but as we came through at Howard, of course, I was introduced uh, to lots of people from the continent and from other countries and really enjoyed that experience. Uh, from that experience, it was my desire at that time to go and volunteer my services uh, on the continent. In fact, I wanted to do some work with SNCC, but it was at that time that I was uh, carrying my first child and knew that that would not be a good thing uh, with a baby in tow. Uh, so I always looked forward to the opportunity to go abroad to our home country of a uh, continent, really, of Africa and work. Irving, tell us about your, I know you have a rural upbringing, so tell us about your, um, your experience in Aberdeen. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I, didn't, I didn't realize that you would remember where it was. <laughs> I remember it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I grew up in this, uh, what I often tell people in this big town of Aberdeen, Maryland, which had about 6,000 people at the time that I was mm. born. Um, some of the things that I think uh, have had a significant effect on me relates to the fact that, um, one, my father was a farmer uh, and uh, he used to uh, tell us about the fact that uh, he only had a sixth grade education, mm -hmm. but there were 10 of us in the family, and he decided uh, that all of his children had to go to school. The oldest child uh, was a sister, and she had to be sent to Philadelphia to live with an uncle. Uh, because there was no high school 
uh, available in Harford County for blacks to attend. The next one was a brother and he had to be sent to Wilmington to live with an uncle uh, who was in Wilmington uh, for the same reason that there was no uh, high school for black kids and it was not until uh, 1930 that there was a high school for black kids to attend. Um, also during that time, uh, the, uh, once the black school was open, um, the parents had to pay money to send their children to the school uh, by transport uh, because uh, those of us who lived in the rural areas, of course, had to get there some way. And there was a train uh, that used to, uh, on the Pennsylvania Railroad, where uh, children used to have to go and then uh, catch the train to go to Harvard Grace, where the high school was located. Uh, I was fortunate in that I was the only one in the family where my father didn't have to uh, spend money for uh, me to uh, go to school uh, after my uh, after the ninth grade, uh, they did then start providing uh, bus transportation for uh, black kids to go to the Highwood Grace High School what at year that was time. That? That was in 1948. Mm -hmm. okay. And all, uh, during the previous years from 1930 until 1948, uh, parents had to spend money uh, to uh, send their kids to school. Not only that, but <coughs> uh, it was uh, about four or five men in the community that uh, got together and decided that uh, they were going to insist on the uh, Harford County Board of Education to provide a high school. So they, uh, um, my father was one of those uh, who got together and had meetings and would go up to Bel Air and uh, meet with the Board of Education and push them to uh, develop this uh, school in Harvard of Grace. Uh, so things like that uh, had a significant uh, effect on me and uh, I'm rather fortunate and uh, very thankful that my father was rather uh, insistent and push that uh, uh, the uh, county assume its responsibilities. You know. So you had um, an, a, more, a role model sort of for, for your activism that uh, came about and uh, later on in your life, your father was a role model. Yes, I think so, mm -hmm. very much so. And Elvira, I, as I recall, uh, you also come from a family of activists. I know that your grandfather was, or well, great grandfather, was a minister. And um, tell us a little bit about uh, the Feltons. Uh, and you have a very distinguished sister who uh, became very um, recognized for the work that she did here in Washington. So. Right. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, my father was born in North Carolina in Pequimus County. Mm -hmm. uh, my father also was a, a minister, but his father was likewise a farmer and had a store, and there were eight in his family. Mm -hmm. um, my father had the opportunity to move from the deep rural area to the roadside where he had his store, and uh, was very active in the community. Um, was very well recognized. My grandfather was very well recognized. In fact, I remember my father saying that his brother and he had, uh, there were two girls and then uh, six boys. And the boy who was a third from the youngest was very active, very outgoing, uh, as they say, suave and cool. And um, one day my father tells me that 
there was a white man that came into the store and said, your son uh, will be hanged tonight by a group of white fathers because he was on the road and having he and another boy and, and the, there were three or four white boys that jumped him and he beat them mercilessly. So this gentleman brought a truck, got him in, put a blanket on, put corn or whatever else on him and got him out to uh, Virginia. Uh, and uh, that always, I always remembered that because uh, not only did, did he not have equity, uh, did they not have equity and equal opportunities to do things, but people are taken advantage of be, and mistreated just because they're black. Sounded like a dangerous time. A very <laughs> dangerous time. My father uh, left and uh, went to Richmond, got a degree there. He was a principal at a school in Bowling Green, and then he came to Howard to do his theology training. What so he's a minister. Was that? What, about what years were those? Do you remember uh, that? that must have been about 1930. About 1930 or maybe late 20s or early 30s. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, while he was in school in Richmond, of course, he had to, he worked on the train. And mm -hmm. I remember him saying that he was on the train that went to Chicago. Mm -hmm. And they were always afraid to get off the train because people were harassed. They were beaten. Uh, and there were gangs there that jumped every black that pretty much got off the train. So I can remember all of that. But my dad, of course, insisted that we all get education. It was not whether you're going, it's that you're going and where you're going. <laughs> so I went to Howard University. My brother um, started at UDC. He played football. And Edward Felton, he worked for the government, for the DC government, and worked with Marion Barry. In fact, he wrote a lot of his speeches for him. Uh, Edward was the one, I had two sisters, uh, Edward was the one who married Zora Felton, who worked for and helped develop the Anacostia Museum mm -hmm. and uh, did very well with community. She, I think she worked with community uh, centers before uh, she and John Kennard. John Kennard was one of my classmates and it was John who, who I think got the grant to start the museum. Mm -hmm. uh, but I remember when they were uh, on, I think it was Nicholas Avenue in uh, theater, I think, and then the museum was developed, and they've done. They did very well with that in terms of helping to provide education for children in far southeast. So you both had uh, family experiences or family members who sort of led the way to, for you to develop your thinking about mm -hmm. where you decided to plant your plant your trough, so to speak, uh, with the. Um, with the activism that you did uh, later on. So here we are now at Howard University. What year was this and um, how did the two of you meet? Were you there at the same time or did you wander off campus one day and run into Irving? How, how did this happen? <laughs> well, I did not meet Irving until I came back to teach at Howard University. Ah. Uh, and students wondered why because I had an undergrad, I had my minor was in zoology so I was down, on, uh, down the hill, chemistry and biology all the time. And they wondered why I didn't know him because he was uh, one of the uh, chemistry assistants or lab instructors. But anyway, I went to Wisconsin, did my work, came back. And then I met Irving. Uh, uh, I think it was, I know it was in the gym. You know, probably during the time you were there too, everybody had to have physicals. Physical well, education, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think that that's necessary. We had a women's gym and a guys, is and that the way it was? Gym. Yeah. yeah, upstairs in the women's gym was where the health center was, uh -huh. as I can recall. Uh -huh. So I'll let him tell the, take the story from well, there. I, yeah, I want to hear the story. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was fortunate that, uh, in that I managed to get a job in the health center when I started medical school. Which years were these? Uh, Give me some years. 1960. Yeah. <laughs> 1960. Yeah. I came back to teach 1961. Okay. I was teaching anatomy okay. uh, upstairs in the, uh, okay. in the women's physical education. Okay. Uh, upstairs we had, a, we had uh, anatomy class for 
uh, physical educators, for nurses, and mm -hmm. for other people who wanted to take the course in anatomy. Yeah, well, okay. I, I uh, had the opportunity of working in the health center, and of course, during the time that the freshman students uh, came, everyone had to have a physical examination, and uh, yeah, right. I uh, worked with the doctors and nurses during the physical examinations, and my job at the time was to examine the urine specimen of the students. And it was during that time <laughs> that uh, okay. uh, someone came past me, I think, and then I was introduced to this lady by the name of Elvira Felton while I was examining the urine specimen. In fact, it was in the hallway to my classroom, so I had to pass him and his little setup there <laughs> to get to my classroom. So that's how we met. I, I, I don't even want to touch that with a joke, so we'll move on. <laughs> so you married uh, eventually, you, and, yeah. and then tell us about how the two of you came to the conclusion that you needed to um, serve the uh, communities in Tanzania and in Africa. I, I uh, had the opportunity to do a fellowship uh, in Boston uh, and uh, um, we were host parents to a fellow from Ghana and one from Nigeria and one of my patients uh, at the Children's Hospital was from Tanzania. So we had the opportunity to talk with the parents and uh, um, I made the decision that uh, sometime when I go to Washington, I wanted to explore the possibilities of going abroad and working in one of those three countries, Tanzania, Ghana, uh, or Nigeria. Okay. And I came down to a pediatric meeting and uh, then I decided to go to uh, look for the embassies. And I found the Tanzanian embassy first. Mm -hmm. I went in and talked with the people at the Tanzanian embassy and made the decision that Tanzania was where we were going. The people in the embassy were just so nice mm -hmm. that uh, I felt that I had no reason to look elsewhere. So we made that decision. A year later, uh, we found ourselves in Tanzania. What year was this? That was in 1974. 1974. And we took yeah. out four children. Yes. Um, let's see, four years old, five years old, <laughs> seven years old, and eight years old. <laughs> so we you packed, packed all your bags yes, and all of yeah. our bags. We made it across the waters. Made it yeah. across the water yeah. and we're very happy that we were there. Well, tell, we tell me there. a little bit about the, uh, ta the experience in Tanzania or what you found, the climate in Tanzania uh, when you came. Who was, who was, what was the government like? Um, who were some of the people that you uh, first touched bases with in, in Tanzania to help you begin the work? Um, just, you just showed up with your suitcases and said, here we are. So who were the folks that helped you? Well, the we, <coughs> I, I signed a contract with the Tanzanian uh, Ministry of Health. Okay. And at that time, uh, there was the, the Minister of Health was Dr. Chiduo, who was in the uh, administration with uh, uh, President Nereri. Okay. Uh, Any time that uh, anyone mentions the name Julius Nereri, mm -hmm. I, I think uh, it should ring a bell as uh, to the fact that this is someone who uh, led an outstanding, exemplary life in all of his activities. But of course, he was a teacher also. But. Uh, I had signed a contract with the Tanzanian government to work at one of the hospitals there. And uh, the, <clears throat> I think after we were there about, about 12 days, I guess, they finally decided that they would send us to the town of Mwanza where I would work. 
because they said, well, we have a pediatrician in the other uh, two teaching hospitals, and, and uh, they wanted someone in each one of the teaching hospitals who had had some experience uh, with pediatrics. But they, they had thought that, they w well, they had decided that we would stay in DAR. I didn't want to stay in Dar. Dar es Salaam. Dar es Salaam, yeah. because mm -hmm. neither one of us did, mm -hmm. because there were so many expatriates. And we found oftentimes expatri expatriates group, and we wanted really to be immersed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I should mention, too, one of the real drawing cards for us going to Tanzania was Wali Munireri mm -hmm. and the work that he yeah. did and his openness and the support that he gave uh, to uh, all of the African countries as well as to African Americans. Mm -hmm. There are still some African Americans there who went over there in the 60s. And he was very, very much supportive. Uh, he was very we welcoming to African Americans. Yes. Very yes. welcoming to African Americans. So. Mm -hmm. In fact, the experience that Irving had at the embassy, we found throughout the country. Mm -hmm. The openness, the friendliness, the supportiveness. And people were really very concerned about me and very uh, sad about my kids because we came and we had no, they had no grandparents. So there were so many families that adopted us right. as, so that my children could have grandparents. Mm, right. and, and because of Irving's uh, um, experience as a farmer, they called him the farming doctor, they gave us land out in the village so we could have our farm. So it was really very, very exciting. But I did not realize until we got back home that Irving was having some real problems initially and I will let him tell you about that. <laughs> well, <clears throat> it was a new area, and uh, after having spent about a month there, uh, rather than going to make rounds one morning, I went off into this uh, cubicle and just sat down and tried to figure out how I was gonna come back home. I was so disappointed really? um, yeah. to see two and three children dying every day from preventable diseases. And that was something I wasn't used to. And uh, it, it, it just saddened me uh, so much that I was ready to come back home. Well, I had signed a contract with the Tanzanian government and they were not about to pay my way back <laughs> after ha having been there just one month. I tried to figure out, well, uh, who in the family could send me some money so that I could come back. Mm -hmm. And uh, after thinking and so forth, I realized that there was nobody in my family uh, who was going to spend money for me to come back home after having been there just a short period of time. So uh, I had to realize, well, I had no other alternative other than to go back uh, and start working. And uh, the, some of the unfortunate things, and one of the things that we decided to do, when we went back to the ward, the children's area, we made the suggestion about how about us having some meetings sometime and talk about some of the problems? And uh, individuals were agreeable to that idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and I should mention the fact that there, was, uh, there were two uh, individuals in the pediatric area from Europe, from England, and there was one from uh, Hungary, uh, uh, as well as uh, uh, a couple of uh, individuals from Tanzania. And everyone agreed that this might be a good idea. So the first meeting that we had, um, I gave a presentation about a little six-month-old baby who uh, had uh, pneumonia, and in the course of oh, oh, the 
directive, this child was getting a tremendous amount of injections each day because during that time, the idea was that if you give a needle, or the term was Sindano, that that cures everything. But instead of and <clears throat> having clean new needles, these needles and syringes had turned brown from overuse and so forth. So as a result of trying to resolve one problem, another one developed. And so uh, this was a major problem that we presented and uh, discussed a good deal about the misuse of uh, uh, injections uh, for not just children, but for anyone. Uh, and we felt that that was something that was not uh, indicated. Another issue that we had <coughs> uh, was uh, that we felt uh, that any child that was fortunate enough to be discharged from the hospital to go home, we should look to see if the child had had any immunizations at all. Uh, everyone agreed to that idea but the day that we agreed that this program would begin, uh, the children were taken to uh, a treatment area, but just left there. And no one would uh, provide any immunizations or see what it was that the children had. Irving is very naive. So, But when we went there, uh, the Europeans, the English well, doctors were running things, and they focused on curative rather than preventive. So it was Irving who set up the immunization program and, uh, and the nutrition program. Well, he's a shy person, we realize yeah. that, but you saw the conditions and, and you tried to, to suggest things and uh, had to go ahead and do it yourself. Yeah. You take charge of yourself. Yes. So, yeah. so um, this, this situation lasted about how long before mm -hmm. you evolved into the uh, nonprofit organization that you started called AHEAD? Well, uh, <clears throat> one of the things that we did was to go to uh, some villages later on to uh, talk about immunization. And this wasn't something that was commonplace during that time. And the year, this year, uh, the year was what? About? Uh, this was in uh, 75, 75 now. Okay. And uh, uh, we went to one area uh, to um, get support for doing a measles immunization campaign because the three major causes of death among children, measles, malnutrition, and malaria. And they call that the big three. So we felt that if we could have a measles immunization campaign, this would solve some of the problem, prevent children from uh, coming down with measles. And the spokespersons for the area said no. We don't want that. Hmm. And uh, that, of course, uh, I was a bit concerned. Why not? They said, well, three years before you came, the World Health Organization had a measles immunization campaign, and within one month, 20 of the children died. Mm -hmm. So we had to look at, well, what are the causes? Uh, why? Mm -hmm. Immunization, uh, this couldn't have been the cause. Well, yes, it was the cause because in the area, malnutrition was very high. Mm -hmm. And if you give a live virus to a malnourished child that has no way of fighting the infection, then uh, that caused the uh, measles to be more severe and this is why the children died. 
So you kept um, running into problems or issues uh, that medical issues that had a solution, but uh, the Tanzanian uh, officials, the health officials, weren't necessarily yeah. um, equipped or knowledgeable about yeah. them. So let's fast forward a little bit. And um, at what point did you decide that you needed to become uh, incorporated and start offering services to the healthcare community and also to the um, to the people of Tanzania so, and the children. Yeah, so after we came back from Tanzania. Which in, was in what, uh, 19 what? Uh, well, we came back in uh, 77. Okay, but, December 77. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. we um, uh, went to a number of organizations to talk about what our feeling was and uh, at that time, the idea was that if children were dying from malnutrition, you have to do something about the nutritional status. Mm -hmm. So our contention was that good health requires good nutrition. Good nutrition requires good agriculture, and education has to be the change agent for sustainability. So we went to a number of agencies here, including USAID, mm -hmm. to talk about uh, what we felt was a problem and uh, try to see what uh, assistance we could get. But at that time, uh, they sort of scoffed at us and said uh, that uh, they felt that uh, we were way off track because you cannot combine three disciplines like health and education and agriculture. You can't combine them uh, and do anything. So our decision was, well, we would just have to do it by ourselves because we were convinced at that time uh, that uh, that was the way things should go. So, so in 1981, so. we established the organization ahead adventures in health education and agricultural de uh, development mm -hmm. and we registered in washington dc um, we had a lot of supporters at that time um, yeah. the late uh honorable or his excellency mm -hmm. um bomani what was paul, his bomani. paul bomani, bomani who was uh, the ambassador to the U.S. from Tanzania was very, very uh, supportive of us and gave us a lot of support. Winfrieda, Dr. Winfrieda Mpanju, at that time she's in Panju, uh, Shimbusho now, was uh, an exchange student here. Well, she was on a, a Truman Fellowship. Um, and uh, she was trying to do field experience. So Humphrey she, Fellow. A Humphrey Fellowship. So she came and she helped us to work and establish that. So we had a lot of support. In addition to uh, Ambassador Bomani and, and uh, Winfried and Panju, YBB Mushala, the late Mushala, mm -hmm. uh, was very supportive of us. Uh, Vita Gaynor, Dr. Vita Gaynor was there to help us. She was on our board. Dr. Flo McKenzie, Floretta McKenzie was on our board. Mm -hmm. And there were lots of Tanzanians who helped us to get underway. And though we could not get money from uh, the U.S. government and at that time from other organizations, uh, we had lots of donations uh, from individuals mm -hmm. and churches. And so that was what gave us the foundation initially to get the program underway. And uh, so we did that, went back in 85, and we went to um, Dr. Chiduo, who was the Minister of Health, when Irving went there initially, asked us to come back to do some work. And he suggested that we should go to Shinyanga because that was the area of greatest need. And I was really impressed at that time because he was from Morgora, but he wanted us to go to uh, Shinyanga. Describe for our listeners or our viewers um, just how the country was divided uh, into the regions and mm -hmm. which regions were considered uh, more populated, which were more rural, which mm -hmm. ones had more uh, issues with health and, mm -hmm. and education so that um, they'll understand the significance of the Shinyanga area, which um, 
is was a very desolate area, okay. and just just give us some some information about uh, the the way that the regions worked in Tanzania. Right, mm -hmm. there are twenty one regions. Dar es Salaam, I think, was uh, at that time considered the capital, even though the uh, uh, Mwalumu, Mwalumu Nyerere mm -hmm. moved it to Dodoma because he said it needed to be in the center of the country. Mm -hmm. So, um, as you know, Dar es Salaam is on uh, the Indian Ocean, and um, uh, all of the expatriates uh, found themselves there because that's where the capital was, that's where a lot of the excitement was. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Arusha was the other region that was very much mm -hmm. excitable and interested for expatriates and outsiders because that was where Mount Kilimanjaro was, that was where the entry to all the parks were, so you found a lot of organizations there. More to the west, uh, Mwanza was one of the larger cities, uh, but also had a lot of rural uh, areas that were, were rural. Mm -hmm. Shinyanga was just south of Mwanza, but it was probably desolated, wild, uh, a wide area, lots of rural. Uh, there are many of the people were not educated uh, other than those who received the education from the country. Because when Nyerere came in, um, in as president, uh, he, he suggested that there had to be education. Everybody had to have education through, through primary school. Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting because people were very excited about that. Mm -hmm. And I'd never seen young people so excited about learning as I experienced in Tanzania. Mm -hmm. But then in the evenings, uh, people in the rural area would have a little radio and they would all go around the radio to get information and to learn the national language, which was Swahili, which was one of the best things that I think uh, President Nereri could have done because it brought people together, it unified people, and though there are probably more than 100 different uh, Tribal. Tribal groups mm -hmm. there, everybody focused around learning learning uh, Swahili. And at the time we were there, because we went there uh, in the early 70s, mm -hmm. so they had been, uh, there had been uh, under the rule of Nyerere since 1961. Uh, but the education, the, no, the literacy rate at that time was 85%. Very, very high. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until he stepped down and other people came in and, and started, uh, uh, started um, accepting resources and all from places like the World Bank and other organizations. But his philosophy, I thought, was tremendous. Education and health care was free mm -hmm. uh, during the rarest time. Okay. And, and then after that, uh, uh, the next president uh, and his administration borrowed money from the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, mm -hmm. but when it came time to pay the loans back, mm -hmm. then they didn't have the money, so what they had to do was to say that we will no longer provide free uh, education. Uh, so uh, the parents and the children and, had to Pay yeah. if they could afford to pay, yes. which yes. most couldn't. Yeah. Which right. Most couldn't. Yeah. So yes. m m many of the children went without education. Yeah. But we're we're happy now that uh, that education is back free for yeah. for for young people, yeah. and we're very impressed. We have not met this president, but we're very impressed with him. Um, mm -hmm. But then back to the other areas, um, many of the other regions in Tanzania were. Uh, did not have access to lots of care. Though education and health were free, um, education was extended throughout the whole country, mm -hmm. even though the, the, the teachers did not have all of the kinds of resources that were needed. Um, when um, um, later on there were groups that were sent out to give, give support, mm -hmm. but uh, for education, but still, they never had enough doctors. How many doctors were there in the country when you went? Uh, 
I don't know the exact number when we first got started, but mm -hmm. uh, when Tanzania got its independence in 1961, there were 15 doctors in the whole country. Oh, wow. For Just more than 28 million, million people. people. Yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So when our organization got underway, we decided that we really needed to work in the rural areas because most of the people who came to give support came to Dar es Salaam or to Arusha. And we felt we needed to go to the rural areas because that's where the people were, that's where the foundation was, and that's where you strengthen. So our mission was to provide support to help people help themselves. Number one, we were- Where did you start? Where did you start doing? Uh, just to um, let people know um, your first projects that um, you began when you first went back armed with the AHEAD organization. Right, yeah, well, what I was going to say, yeah, one of our big objectives was to reduce and eliminate preventable diseases. So the first thing we did was to set up an immunization program. And we had to oftentimes, it started in, in very rural areas of Shinyanka, and we often had to walk to these areas uh, to provide immunizations. And I need to stop for a moment and say that we've had a tremendous volunteer uh, program because it's uh, volunteers who've come from the U.S., from the Caribbean, uh, and also some from Europe to provide support for us. That's where we got a lot of our support. Mm -hmm. So we provided unique opportunities for graduates, for professionals, for undergraduates to go and to pair themselves with the local people, uh, with their counterparts in country, though all of the doctors and nurses could, did not have sufficient counterparts, they grouped and we provided support. Mm -hmm. And it was really tremendous support that they gave and um, the, the final thing that most of the volunteers said is that we came to provide support, but we've gotten so much more from the experiences because they went out. We went out on foot. We took our, it was a pressure cooker that we took from here that we had to take to boil needles because Irving told you about the needles mm -hmm. that they use. Mm -hmm. We would go out to the village. We would boil needles, let them cool down. And whether it was at a schoolhouse at the chief's house, uh, under a tree, or wherever, we would set up and uh, we would provide immunizations for children five and under, and also we provided prenatal care for mothers, because that was a big thing. So well, mm -hmm. Another major emphasis was on nutrition. Mm -hmm. uh, usually, uh, before we started immunizing or uh, seeing patients, Mm -hmm. We would have a session where we would talk about health issues, and nutrition was one of those things uh, that we felt was very, very important. So that was a major factor mm -hmm. as well that we talked mm -hmm. about. And later on, we did set up a nutrition uh, program mm -hmm. in the Shinyanga region so that when we had a child that was uh, significantly malnourished, this child stayed uh, at a special area along with the mother and we provided the nutritional support and food for uh, bringing this child along. Wow. So uh, you, you were called at one time the, uh, the uh, farming doctor. And um, what, uh, what brought that title to you? <laughs> what, what were you doing uh, that <coughs> they people call you the farming doctor. Can you describe well, what you did? I called upon my experiences growing <laughs> up. <laughs> uh, good, good, good. Yeah, I, I, uh, yeah. I, I had the notion that uh, nutrition was very, very important. So, uh, and, and as we experienced uh, it, it, with the uh, measles uh, situation, that the yeah, air nutrition was important, so you've got to have good nutrition to, in order to maintain good, healthy children. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, um, one of the things that we felt was important, uh, you can't just talk about things, but you got to demonstrate. So, uh, where we lived, uh, we had to have uh, uh, vegetables in our backyard 
growing so people could see the vegetables. Not only that, but we had to have chickens as well, so we grew, we, we raised chickens uh, so people could see uh, that uh, there was uh, another source of good nutrition. One of the <clears throat> unfortunate things uh, that we experienced also was a idea that there are certain things that were taboo when women were pregnant. And mm -hmm. protein, such as eggs, fish, those were things that pregnant women should not eat. Wow. Um, and this was among certain groups. Mm -hmm. And these were things that they certainly should have had more of. Mm -hmm. So we had to emphasize and, and uh, re-educate uh, some of the families. Uh, and of course, particularly and unfortunately, I have to say this, we had to re-educate the males to realize that there are certain things that women should have more so than they, and, and nutritional care was one of those uh, things mm. that was important. So was that where you began so, your educational ahead is, is the Adventures in Health? health. Education, education and, and agricultural, agricultural development. development. So yes. Tell us a little about the, um, the educational program that you set up. And I know you had a lot to do with that, Elvira. Well, um, we did. We thought mm -hmm. it was very important to provide support for young women uh, mm -hmm. because in, in uh, most families, uh, it was a young man. If the family was able to provide resources and provide money, they didn't have very much or sell some of their cattle uh, for school. It was for the young man, because the young man is the one who carries on the name and who would be there. Uh, so we started providing uh, educational support and scholarships for young girls. Uh, and that worked out very, very well when we were in uh, Shinyanga. We expanded that when we got to um, Kisarawe. Uh, I was able to get support from a friend of mine who worked mm -hmm. with USAID mm -hmm. and at that time they were looking to provide support and train women to, for the world of work. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were able to get not much but we did get some money and we set up a secondary program for girls and Irving felt that if the girls are going to be educated they needed to have young men who also had some skills and some education. So our scholarships were for males and females at the secondary school level. And I think in Kisarawe, which is near, uh, near not too far from the Indian Ocean, um, and it was predominantly Muslim, uh, and you know the young girls are trained to start preparing for motherhood and for, for wife as a homemaker from grades three. So we had the programs and the young girls were very enthused as we brought people together and had meetings. Uh, and I must say for everywhere we work, we have committees. We have village committees that help us run the program. So we don't come from the outside and say you need this or you need to do a certain thing. So in the end, I think we provided about 725 scholarships for young people who were from impoverished family or orphan students. And I think it was about eight different high schools that we sent them to in Kisarawe. Also realizing that girls had a challenge uh, because they were violated, going for water, uh, mm -hmm. walking to school, living in homes of people that they did not know. Families were from one village and they were at a village maybe five or six miles away. The parents did not know them. So the young ladies were violated. So we did uh, complete the building of two dormitories uh, at two different sec uh, secondary schools, mm -hmm. which made it well and made it much easier for girls and much more uh, relaxing for them to go to school and to study. Uh, because in these families also, they had to take a role of housekeeper, cleaning, et cetera. So at the schools, we provided dorm mother to provide support for them. And uh, we then had 
water, provided tanks of water, uh, and we provided some irrigation because uh, we thought it was important for them to farm, starting the idea mm -hmm. with Irving. Mm -hmm. uh, we, had, uh, we had farms, uh, uh, experimental farms that people went to, uh, some of the posts that people went to. This was not just for the girls, but also for the villagers in terms of educating them nutrition for nutritional reasons. But we weren't trying to bring ideas from outside. You know, people mm -hmm. come from different areas of the country and it was really exciting because everybody would demonstrate their food. So we ended up, you know, having colossal things. Now, back to education. The other thing that we realized is that we wanted to know what skills beyond the secondary skills mm -hmm. that kids needed. And so we set up a vocational program mm -hmm. where we had electronics and electrical wiring. Wiring, we had, we had computer Computers. technology, Cognitive. we had horticulture, horticulture or agriculture, and we had uh, carpentry. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we gave about 25, we, had, we trained about 25 students. We set up the programs. Uh, the young people uh, who came to, to take the classes were taking classes from Tanzanians. And afterwards, the young people that we trained, we gave further training so that they go to different areas of the country and get more advanced studies. And then in the end, after the third year, all of the teachers were teachers that came through our program. It's These young remarkable. kids were amazing. Mm -hmm. And I need to say at least 75% of these students are, have jobs now. Mm -hmm. Some with the government, some with nonprofit, some with private agencies. And the little kids who are doing the um, carpentry, you can go into Dar es Salaam and out into the areas and realize that they have set up their little businesses mm -hmm. and they do a tremendous job. We, uh, um, the vocational program, we've had over 800 students, 825 students to finish the to vocational finish. In program. In the uh, Kisarari district. In the Kisarari. Mm -hmm. and, and our most, the ones that were really uh, most exciting and were the children got the most from and got better jobs from were electronics, electrical wiring, mm -hmm. and computer. And I can remember when Irving talked to the government about that, they said, well, we don't have electricity here. We said electricity is coming this year. Mm -hmm. And the kids then find their way to the cities, and so they've seen computers and they mm -hmm. wanted to learn. That's right. <laughs> uh, and they are the ones who ask for the training. And I went to one home one day, uh, one of the teachers had invited us for dinner, and he was expanding his house, and he wanted to show us his wiring, uh, his electrical wiring layout. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, that's excellent. And he said, do you know who did it? And I said, no, please tell me. He said, the, I had students. Oh. So the students have done well. Some yes. of them are working now in the, in the parks, in the mm -hmm. Serengeti. Some of them are working in the government, uh, at the, for the national security. Some of them are working with the military and, they, and many of them are working with schools. So they have really, really done very well. And it's not because of us, we just provide the opportunities. They were really anxious and the parents were anxious for them to have. You um, have given us so much information and we, we're just so proud of all of the things that you've been able to accomplish uh, with just a little bit of help from people from the United States. I want to go back to your volunteer program because um, I, I know that you've taken several hundred people over in the life of Ahead and can mm -hmm. you describe uh, just who those volunteers are? What, what is their profile? Are they students? Are they elderly? Are they professional, health professionals? Who, who, is the vol who makes up the volunteer cadre of um, All of the above. Okay. First we had <laughs> doctors and nurses because of Irving and the program that we set up mm -hmm. and putting emphasis on health. Um, and we've had surgeons, we've had general practitioners, we've had pulmon, pulmonologists, we've had um, um, structural um, engineers, engineers. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had retired teachers, teachers psychologists, we've had ag specialists, all of the above, from many of the universities, mm -hmm. a lot of the African, the historically black mm -hmm. colleges uh, oh. provided a lot for us. What, what were some of the students schools from Howard, mm -hmm. from Morgan, mm -hmm. uh, from Spelman, 
from Atlanta, uh, is it Atlanta College? Atlanta University. Atlanta yeah. University. Mm -hmm. um, the school, I can't remember the one in North Carolina, uh, where our board president, Ruby Rubens, was. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, it was one of the historically black schools. Uh, mm -hmm. The one where Maya Angelou, in the same area, where Maya oh, was, yeah. not the school uh, she worked at, but in the same area. Okay. Yeah. And I can remember the little guy who tried to raise money who had never, he, had, he lived in Richmond, had gone from Richmond to this school, and I can't think of the name of it, and I don't know why. <laughs> um, That's all right. Uh, it's all right, I know you've had so many. He had never been on the train before, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we've had students from Lincoln University, from UDC, how can I forget UDC when, yeah. uh, when yeah. Maya Muna, yeah. Michelle Coghill, she's Coghill Chapman now, mm -hmm. Dr. Chapman, who is a professor here now, at the university, uh, was one of our first volunteers from UDC. So we've had students from UDC also. So many of the historically black colleges. We would have probably had many more, but the schools really did not have the resources. But I was very, uh, I was very pleased with the fact that they helped students raise money to come and work with us. And uh, though the majority of them have been African Americans, we've had young people from Africa who studied here. We've had Caribbean students uh, from uh, the Virgin Island, University of the Virgin Island. We've had a couple of students from there, and it has gone well. We've had well over 300. So and these uh, one of the uh, Caribbean countries, Bermuda, well, actually it's not a Caribbean, it's in the Atlantic, but <laughs> you think of it, uh, has a support group, yes. Right? Yes. a formal yeah. support group there yeah. for you, right? I had Bermuda mm -hmm. uh, started by Dr. Deborah Tuzo, so. and we've had at least 25 volunteers to come to Tanzania. They've come to Shinyanga, they have gone to uh, Kisarawe, and they've been doctors. We've had uh, some. We've had a minister of health who came with us, and mm -hmm. they've provided money uh, mm -hmm. for resources. They've shipped books and other educational yeah. supplies. They've shipped dental equipment, net medical equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, they have done a lot to keep our programs going. In fact, here on this side, many of the people who have not been able to go have raised money, mm -hmm. and I think we've had about eight shipments of here, of medical beds, of mm -hmm. medical supplies, mm -hmm. uh, and various kinds of equipment. This year, Donna and her husband, Alpanari Ngira, shipped a, a load of dental equipment mm -hmm. and supplies. Because Donna being your daughter, my daughter, <laughs> your, Donna, your yes. dentist's daughter. Right? Yes, in fact, they were the ones who took the crew this year uh, to uh, Tanzania, yeah. uh, and they really have done things. They painted uh, a clinic mm -hmm. and uh, laid the foundation for a children's ward that we're building. We have installed electricity. This is Bukoba now, on the other side, on the western side of Lake Victoria. So and you've had your, your children have taken the mantle up where as you get older and have to not go back and forth quite so much as you were before, then your children have stepped up right. and become the leaders of uh, the programs that are going right. on in the head. And most of them are in the medical profession. Is that, is right. that correct? Yeah, that's yeah. correct. Yeah. That's correct. Uh, yeah, yes. we want to, can you give us their names and what uh, they do? Yeah. Andrea <laughs> Williams Kingslow, mm -hmm. her husband, Dr. Leslie Kingslow is on the board. There's Irving, named after his father, Williams, who's also a pediatrician, who's on our board. There's Michael Williams, who's not on the board, but Michael has uh, done a whole lot in terms of helping us to, um, helping us to uh, improve our program. Mm -hmm. And uh, also started the Minority Scholars Program in Montgomery County. Mm -hmm. uh, and who did I forget? Donna Ngira <laughs> Williams yeah. and her husband. Her husband mm -hmm. is from Bukoba. And uh, her interest is, she's a dentist. dentist. Mm -hmm. And I think it was 1988, she first went over to start a dental program, followed by uh, Dr. Tuzo, who also is a dentist. Mm -hmm. And we have two generations of Williams now working in Tanzania. In Tanzania. Yeah. It's a remarkable and story. How, um, if uh, people see this program, how um, might they get in touch with you at Ahead and um, contribute or even see if they, would be um, interested in volunteering if they, uh, do you have volunteer opportunities now for folks? Well, I, I would first suggest they go online, mm -hmm. www.aheadinc.org, 
www.ahead.org, not .com, aheadinc.org. And uh, they will find a telephone number there. Uh, and if uh, they can contact us personally, uh, we're mm -hmm. looking for people to go. This year, uh, Kathleen um, Trick. Trick, who's on our board, mm -hmm. uh, went and took her crew. Uh, she and her husband have a reality show in New York called We Are the Joneses. Mm -hmm. So he's a physician, and he went this year to work, and she uh, did a lot with the orphanages. So they can go online, www.aheadinc.org. And if someone wanted to contribute to your effort, how would they get there? They can still contribute online. Okay. Uh, there have been many people who have supported, uh, supported us. Uh, one of the things that I need to mention is the um, ambulance, the village ambulance that uh, was created for us. And it was just a motorcycle with a gurney on the side. And North Bethesda United Church gave us funds for that as well as a lot of individual donors who provided funds for that. Mm -hmm. And I should remember, I told you about our committees in Tanzania. We never go in and tell people what to do. We have a, uh, an, a committee or an organization there uh, that has been very, advisory council, I should call them. Um, ben, uh, Boniface um, Luhende, Luhende started off as one of our volunteers. In fact, he was in uh, Shinyanga with us as a student mm -hmm. and came through and now he is uh, on the, on the um, staff uh, at University of Dar es Salaam. He's a lawyer and they just sent him to South Africa and he's just completing his PhD in law. Uh, we've been very proud mm -hmm. of him. Uh, people in, uh, can also contact Others in Tanzania, Dr. Um, Kifai. Dr. Kifai has also been one of our long-term supporters. Mary Ayakuzi, there are a lot of people there. Uh, the Chanjis, Dr. Chanji. In fact, his son Lakuba was one who helped set up, uh, Lakuba Chanji set up our program. Uh, and uh, also Winston Nicholas, the late Winston Nicholas. Mm -hmm. Also, he and his wife, have been very supportive of us. And I should mention the Narabus were really key in helping us to move this. Uh, they both are, uh, the ambassador, His Excellency, Charles Narabu has passed now. And his wife, um, Rachel, Rachel Narabu, yeah. volunteered and worked in our office. So yeah. we do have opportunities stateside also for people who want to work. So Absolutely. we encourage anybody to find out about a head ink and you go online put a head ink dot uh, org and they could find they can find us and we encourage people to go from whatever profession whether you're retired whether you're undergraduate it gives you a tremendous opportunity to get to know people and work side by side with people mm -hmm. in the country excellent is it did you like to add anything yes Dr. there's one other thing i would mm -hmm. like to add and that is uh, one of the individuals that was very much instrumental in helping us uh, uh, get funding for our programs, none other than a lady by the name of Karen Spellman. Uh, Who's I'm also sure on you our don't board know of her, <laughs> but <laughs> also on our board of directors and was key in helping us get to get two vehicles plus expand our immunization uh, program and we're very grateful for the work that you did with us. We're just, uh, I think people in Washington and all over the country are grateful for the sacrifices that you and your family have made on behalf of the, our brothers and sisters in Tanzania. And you've also given us a fine example of a self-help organization that started with uh, very little and has been able to do so much. So um, for those young people who are always looking for an opportunity to travel abroad and learn more about our, uh, our African roots, I would highly recommend that you travel with uh, Baba and Mama Williams, as they're called, to Tanzania. So thank you both very much for being a part of the Black Power Chronicles and for coming and sharing your story this afternoon. Thank you very much. And we thank you Good very, luck. very much. Harambe. Yeah, Harambe. <laughs> yes, yes. <Okay. laughs> Good. Uh.